I'm just trying to pull myself together when I hear conversations like this. Because when you start off saying that a lot of this should be the state's right, the states or the territories, that you should increase insurance and, you know, you're concerned about paying cost share for insurance, when this is the same body that underfunds the territories to begin with, that puts arbitrary caps on Medicaid, puts arbitrary caps, defunds us in terms of the amount of funding that we receive in um, transportation costs in other areas, and then when a disaster strikes and we're unable to meet those costs, it becomes a, a question of why aren't we being responsible about our stuff. It just freaking drives me crazy. And I'm just trying to pull myself together to ask the questions that I know I'm supposed to ask of you that are related to the issue that's at hand. When Congress is more concerned with uh, imposing on the territories uh, restrictions on cockfighting and roosters, but don't give a damn about the children or the seniors in those areas and their costs and their needs and their rights, that just, just incenses me that this body acts that way. Mr. Long, uh, you said that uh, there's concern about the cost share. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you was why FEMA has not decided to exercise its clear authority under the Insular Area Acts to waive non-federal cost share for public assistance permanent work in the Virgin Islands, such as under Category F, which are the utility costs, that the uh, Insular Areas Act does authorize you to be able to do. When you have areas like the territories that have been underfunded uh, in these other areas, you know that there are budget issues that they have, and they're unable to meet those cost shares. So, so a large portion was funded at 100 percent initially. Uh, right now, the cost share is at 90-10, if I remember correctly, and that is above and beyond the 75-25. The, the, the question that we have, and, and it's also my understanding that uh, we are reviewing uh, a request from the U.S. Virgin Islands right now to go through, and we will methodically look at that and try to make the best decision that we can. But often when it comes to the offset of that 10 percent that they have to look at, there's ways of uh, utilizing or accounting for voluntary management organizations that have provided in-kind match that will reduce. And then also when HUD CDBGDR funding comes into play, a lot of that money can actually be used to offset the match as well. So we, you know, and, and, and traditionally, when the President grants 100 percent, it is typically when there is still emergency work, um, life safety work that, that, that takes place. And all of this comes into account, not only that, but how much money does the, the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico or Texas, whatever they so, have. So, and how, what is the determinant of life saving work, considering that our mobile hospitals still are not up, um, our dialysis patients are right. still away? How does that work? Fair question. So there's two types of uh, work that we do, emergency work and permanent work. And once we uh, basically have come to a conclusion uh, on the emergency, the emergency work that's being done and we transition into the permanent work, that's where the cost share comes in. And if there's not even the slightest bit of cost share, from where I sit, when there's a cost share involved, that means there's also skin in the game, which helps us all focus on what's the most important way of going forward in recovery. And, and that's just the truth. When it comes to how do you focus, if you have a little bit of money to put forward, then it helps us to fine tune what are the true goals of the Virgin Islands, Florida, California, or whatever it may be, you know, any state that's going through this to focus where they are. But, but um, we are evaluating the, the cost share ask as we speak. And we, you know, we take this very seriously. So, so when you talked you. about that, um, we talked, uh, and I know there was a GAO report that talked about um, the disaster, particularly in terms of housing recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been a major issue in the Virgin Islands with the number of homes that have been destroyed. Um, Army Corps of Engineers came in. The, the blue tarp was, was uh, slow in its processing. They've now moved to in-house permanent uh, mm -hmm. uh, sheltering, sheltering in place, which is beginning to work. Um, at what point will FEMA reconsider the use of Disaster Housing Assistance Program, DHAP, like what was put in place after Hurricane Katrina to respond to the needs of displaced households? Mm -hmm. And what factors or criteria will promote a change in that position? So there's a, there's a misunderstanding about DHAP. Um, DHAP was the traditional housing program that we would use to help some of those that were, that were misplaced. But after Sandy occurred, the Sandy Improvement Act gave FEMA new authorities to do what's called direct lease. So basically, we have now been given the authority as a result of going through Sandy to do the same thing that DHAP basically accomplishes. It's a duplicative program for the most part. And in many cases, if 
If a person does not qualify for our housing assistance under the direct lease program, then most likely they're not going to also you know, qualify for the DHAP program. So a lot of this is just based around misinformation, but also, more importantly, new tools in my toolbox that you you have provided uh, to me from from Congress, which is which is good. Um, okay, and just some administrative things because I know my time has run out. I have, um, Mr. Chair, several statements from residents and other individuals of the Virgin Islands, observations on the federal response to Maria in Puerto Rico submitted by Jeffrey um, A. Parks, as well as a statement for the record uh, from Megan Enright, a resident of St. John. I ask that those be submitted. Without objection. Thank you. And also, sir, um, I wanted to know, Mr. Long, if you would get, if I could receive the weekly recovery status reports that you have. Um, do you have copies of that that my office can receive? Um, starting from, um, what are we in now, in December? Uh, so could we get several months going back of those? Um, uh, there's some clear questions as to what are the projects that are most important that our governor has outlined, that his work has outlined. And I do believe that you all are, have the best interest in mind. Um, and, you know, the shifting of blame between local government and federal government has got to end. People have got to man up, woman up, and take responsibility for their shortcomings. I know that the GAO, uh, you were willing to listen to what they said in terms with regard to you. I'd like our own local government to do that and see where the people of the Virgin Islands to see where those gaps are. Sure. Yes, ma'am. We'd be happy to provide Thank you. Uh, reports. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, with your indulgence. And may I also submit for the record um, the local Senator Janelle Sorrow also gave a testimony at our congressional field hearing on her observations and issues that she saw between the local and federal government with regard to uh, the recovery. 